Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today I'm honored to have Vin Montello, one of the legends of copywriting. He's known as the godfather of persuasion. He came to marketing after 20 years of writing compelling entertainment programming in Hollywood. And I'm going to make him blush with this intro, but it's all true. He sold a million dollars in 18 hours for one client and went on to generate nearly half a million a month for an entire year for another. He is known as a guy who turns little guys big. So that's why I'm excited to have him on. And on a few occasions, he's made millionaires out of kids half his age. One of his recent successes, he had a client make a few hundred thousand in two months, but then he was able to sell off 90% of his business for seven figures. Vin, thank you so much for joining me. You were talking to my mother. I think she gave you all that stuff. I would talk to you. I would have her on the show. <laughs> well, God, she's not here. But, okay. Well, I'm uh, sorry nice about bummer. that. Um, uh, first, I, I will actually uh, argue with you on one point. Go you ahead. said for 20 years. What was that in the intro about for 20 years? Of writing what? compelling entertainment programming in Hollywood. Yeah, I'd say for a lot of those years, it was less than compelling entertainment <laughs> television. Which we'll talk about. And okay, that sure. kind of gets me into the first question, which I noticed with your writing is you do an amazing job with cliffhangers. And I, I've tried to do this in my intros, and I just don't do a good job of it. And so I want to ask one we should use now, and then we'll wait for the end to introduce it, and how people should use them. Okay. Um, well, first of all, let me set up cliffhangers. Remind me to give the cliffhanger at the end. I will. I will. Um, okay. So uh, cliffhangers, the way I, you know, they come from way before our time. They come from the Saturday morning serials in the movie theaters, mm -hmm. where you know our grandparents would go see a, on a Saturday afternoon. They'd see like. For 50 cents, they'd go see like 17 movies, and nine of them were serials where you'd get like 15 minutes of a movie, and then it would it would end, the name got, it got the name Cliffhanger because it was literally like a guy hanging off a cliff, okay. and you think the hero of the movie is about to fall to his death, and then it would say, come back to this theater next Saturday, Hate same those. time, right. and the kids would all go to see what happened, and of course... You know, a hawk would come out of nowhere and grab the guy by the collar and say some mm. stupid thing, and then he'd be off on another adventure that would leave him at another cliffhanger. So that's how it all started, and it's been used throughout the years. Television used it. I mean, I don't know how old you are, Jeremy, but when I was a kid, if you were, if anybody's my age, you remember same bat channel, same bat station. Sure, yes, that yes. was a cliffhanger. You know, they would always be left. What's going to happen to our, our, you know, Cape Crusaders? Um, and uh, I noticed it more recently as an adult uh, on television, uh, on the news. And this is what you, you see this, and I'll, I'll do an exaggeration of it, but you'll see like, tonight the household chemical in your closet that is killing your children, right. <laughs> but first skip with sports. Right. It's like they hold it just to keep you at the edge of your seat, yes. and then they're going to pay it off later. So now I'll give you a cliffhanger. Yes. This will be a good cliffhanger. I'll reveal, by the end of this interview, I'll reveal the identity of a straight-off-the-bus kid who sold two television shows to Hollywood just in an attempt to pick up a girl. Okay. How's that? Yeah, I like it. Because I'm reading your copy, and I mean... I could see the cliffhanger, but there's things that are in there that I don't even know if are meant to be cliffhangers that are cliffhangers. For instance, one when I was reading, one word that dooms 99% of bad copy. So I was reading through this whole copy of yours. I'm like, what is this one word? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. It's funny. I, I don't – there is no one word. There are a million ways to answer the one word question, and right. people have asked this question a million times. Right. Um, I, I will say that if even the way you said that, the one word that dooms all copy, up next, but first skip with sports. It's the same damn thing. Right. It's basically, uh, it's basically, hey, I've got the answer to all your problems, and I'll give you that answer right now. But first, let's talk about your business. It's right. that same thing. Hold them at the edge of the seat and make them stay there. You know, there's this concept of, of loops, in stories. I'm sure you've heard of this mm -hmm. concept. Zagarnik is famous for, uh, you know, Zagarnik was a Russian waiter, I guess, and um, or he tested waiters, something like that. But the basic test was that a waiter in Russia, they were like professional waiters, they could hold on to an entire table, like a ten top of orders in their head. 
and they'd hold everything, get everything right, who didn't want the borscht, who wanted extra borscht, everything. And then the second the last dish was brought to that table, they would immediately wipe it from their brain. And this was like a phenomenon that somebody figured out. Mm -hmm. And it's used in persuasion also, uh, you know, a, a, an open loop where you open the loop. Yeah. I'm going to show you the one, uh, the one thing that's dooming all copy. Yes. And then you don't close that loop until after you've made an offer. So you're keeping their attention the whole time yeah. you're selling them. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's all cliffhanger and yeah. it's done every day. And uh, I'm giving so you a new, and you're not the godfather of persuasion. You're the godfather of open loops because I, uh -huh. when I'm reading this stuff. So what is the, what is one word that dooms copy? Um, you know, it's, <laughs> I will tell you this. I think that if I had to answer that question, yes. comedy is one of the words that will doom copy because, um, because comedy is, is something that, you know, there's an old, I don't know where it comes from. Comedy is serious business, but it's true. If you really don't understand comedy, mm -hmm. uh, very, very well, you don't want to mess with it because mm -hmm. that's how you offend people. There's a story. Um, I wasn't there. I think I was at the event. I was at a seminar or I'd heard about the seminar where a very big time marketer, like one of these big names you hear about who's been doing this forever. Mm -hmm. And he went into a room and he decided he was going to, he was in a seminar, a marketing seminar, and he decided to start his, his presentation with a joke. Just, you know, they say you, you, when you're speaking, start with a joke and just to get the crowd kind of loose. And he opened up with a joke he had just heard that was a lawyer joke. And it was met with 90% silence, some muttering. It was not good. And I think he went into flop sweat from that point. And uh, com comedians experience this. That's where the sweat rolls down the crack of your butt. <laughs> and, um, and I think he was experiencing that. And it was all because what he didn't know going in was he had about 70 lawyers in the room. So he was doing an anti-lawyer joke to a group of lawyers. And... That's it. An amateur playing with something they shouldn't have been playing with. You got to know your audience. And uh, if you don't know your audience specifically, comedy is deadly. Now, in my business, we have to know our audience. Right. It's, if, if you don't know your audience, you have no chance of winning. You're not going to win all the time anyway. But if you don't know your audience, your chance of winning is like almost nothing. So um, even with professionals – it's there's still some guessing in there. You think you know your audience. You you've done the research to know your audience, but you may not know your audience. So even with people who've done comedy before, yeah. it's um, it's it's dangerous it's ground. It's icy. hard to pull off. Yeah. So I mean, we'll get into your background because you've done stand up comedy before. So has there uh, been a time where you used comedy and it just backfired in the copy, or did you just avoid it because? It's not something you should do. I can't think specifically of a time that I've used it where it's failed. I'm sure it has early on, um, especially because you you know you takes time to learn lessons. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know specifically. Uh, obviously, um, I did stand up. So, yeah. and I've also spoken from the stage. So I've used comedy live. Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's in the hands of a professional. I kind of knew. Right. I'm not going to go out there and do a joke assuming people all want to laugh at a lawyer joke. I'm going to tell a joke that I'm pretty sure everyone's going to yeah. be into. Yes. And it was something to do with the hotel we were at. So everybody in the room had paid for the same hotel. Everyone in the room had paid for the same seminar. So I figured I'd take a couple knocks at the hotel and it seemed to go over real yeah. well. So, um, but yeah, I'm sure You're that I've You're a trained professional. So. I was, I'm a formerly trained formerly professional. professional. Because I think I talked to, from what I read, one of your students, Kevin Rogers. Uh, it, Kevin? it seems to be a theme of copywriters to be stand-up comedians. And I think he also mentioned, don't use comedy. Uh, maybe, maybe I think it was him. Don't use comedy in your copy. You never know how people are going to respond or something yeah, like that's, that. Yeah, it, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And there's no need to. Now, there are things that I try to write with a humor in the text 
but not jokes in the copy. Mm -hmm. So I try to write in an interesting way that keeps it kind of, oh, that was a nice turn of a phrase that someone else might use in a funny way, mm -hmm. but I'll use it in the context of the copy. Kevin was not only one of my students, my first student. I first started mentoring copywriters with him. and um, I have like and three generations. Like I have David, right? And I have you. <laughs> and then Ke right. David was my mentor. David Garfinkel, yes. I was about halfway through my mentorship with David, and uh, and then Kevin was still working. A day. I don't want to tell the whole story of him. I've known Kevin since he was like just got out of high school. He went to high school with my sister. Oh wow! And and I was a stand up comic, and um and I, I'd already moved out of town. I think I moved to Los Angeles, and he was just starting out as a new comic. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to town, it's like this homecoming thing when you come back. And I was kind of introduced to him, and he was kind of the kid, the kid who wants to be a comedian and started doing open mics. And he got funny real fast, a talented guy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, so I, I had known him in the very beginning. He ended up moving to L.A. for a short while, and I knew him there. And then after I got into copy, um, someone had mentioned on Facebook, like, uh, name, the, name the one book that's on your desk right now. And at the time, I was taking a specific copywriting course, and the book was on my desk. So I put the name of that book down, and no one else ever heard of that book, except Kevin said, I got that same book on my desk. And so we started talking again and realized that he was still doing a day job, and not, he'd not transferred over to copy yet. And uh, so we had talked, and in, in the early days, I helped him get his start, gave him some clients, helped him through some projects. And uh, he's done fairly well for himself. Very well, yeah. He's done very well. So yeah. what was the book? Uh, the book was, I don't want to give them a plug because it wasn't even a great book. Oh, okay. I figured if, it's, it, if, it's, if it affected you, if you thought it was good, then. It, it, put it this way. It was a course. It was a, it was a copywriting course. Yeah. And I'd never written copy before in my life. Right. But, um, but I took this course. And about halfway through it, you have an assignment in the book where you have to write a specific sales letter. And I wrote the sales letter, and it scored like the highest anybody had ever scored on it in 10 years or something crazy like that, which normally would give somebody a punch in the arm. But for me, it made me go, well, crap, I must not be learning that much you if all it. these other students couldn't write it as good as me. And I didn't think it was that good. So I felt like, yeah, this is kind of not great. So I don't even know if Kevin finished the book either. But um, but no, mentoring is was the big thing, and you're probably going to ask this later. Yes. Like, no, yes. Mentoring was a huge deal, yes. and I recommend it to anyone yes. trying to get into this. We'll get business. into some of your mentors, some of the advice I gave you. And, and one other thing you put in there was really interesting, Vin, was that you take an approach that most people don't take. Okay. Um, you take an approach to writing that you stole from the days of Hollywood. Yeah. Well, tell me is, about that. Okay, that's how I romanticize it. You know, in television, <laughs> and it's funny because it's something that a lot of people blame for being the problem with television that I believe is actually something that's good for television, mm -hmm. and, and that's why I stole it. Um, I've worked on sitcom staffs before. Um, we, I did a sitcom back in the 90s on Fox that um, nobody ever heard of because it was on Thursday nights up against Seinfeld. So no one ever saw it. Uh, especially someone like you, Jeremy. I'm sure you were watching Seinfeld on Thursday nights, weren't you? I mean, I don't know if I watched that much TV, but I did watch Seinfeld. Yeah. Well, I did too. Yeah. And I know, I, I know you Thursday, didn't watch nights would come, Thursday nights would come, I didn't even watch my show. <laughs> I would get a tape on my desk the next morning. What was it called? Um, uh, it was called, I don't want to put down the show, it was called Between Brothers. And it was okay. a sitcom that starred Tommy Davidson. And it was. I like Tommy was, Davidson. Yeah, Tommy yeah. Davidson's funny. Yeah. And but the show was really it was Fox trying to counter program. They wanted to. Um, they want. They said, well, listen, all the white people are watching Seinfeld, so uh, how about we try to get the black people? And uh, so they came up with this show. They put a couple pretty big black stars in there, uh, and uh, and then hired a bunch of white guys to write it, which was funny. Uh, that was one of the you problems. Being one we of only, them. Me being one of them, yes. we had a staff of about eleven writers, and three of them were of color. And uh, so, how so. do you decide? How do you start to formulate a show like that? Do you sit all oh. in a room, and what? How does that work? Um, okay, to write the show, this is the thing. Uh, sitcoms. This is where I was going. My stories yeah. take tangents. I like your um, tangents, but go on. Okay, um, the a sitcom is written 
what's called gang writing, it's mm -hmm. called. And basically, pieces of an episode are given out. Well, someone's given the show to write. And then um, while they're writing that, pieces are given out to other people to, to incorporate into that episode or to change what's there or add to it or something like that. And then when an episode comes in and gets on the, the boss's desk, then becomes the real writing, which is the table writing. And that's where the gang goes in and tears it up. And, and it gets torn up a lot during the process. First is the first you know big table uh, um, session. And that's usually a nine in the morning till two in the morning kind of thing. Wow, really? It's a, it's a bunch of, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of writers trying to one up one another and trying to just do better than what was written in the script. And you do that, and it takes a long time. It's infuriating. It's People hard. are arguing. It's a lot of arguing. It's a lot of, ju I just want to get out of here. It's just a lot of, a lot of it seems like feudal fighting. And, um, and, but in the end, you get, I mean, arguably, what I believe is the best that product can be comes mm -hmm. out of that room. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it's all good because there's a lot of bad TV that's written really well, mm -hmm. but it turns into, hey, listen, that's the best I could do with the Teenage Witch. I, it's all I could do. <laughs> it's still a freaking Teenage Witch. Right, you know? right. So, um, so it, it's kind of like that where you go in and you gang write. So I took that. I thought, you know, the one thing we miss in the, in the world of – of entrepreneurship, online working, having virtual clients around the world, is we tend to uh, write in vacuums. We tend to be yes. locked in a room alone. Right. And I was, I was no different. Uh, I did that in the beginning of my career. And then as I started mentoring people, and I saw that the people I mentored could actually go on and do well, I thought, well, I would like to still have a working relationship with these people. So I came up with situations where I could build a team and I took the best of the best and I kept them on a team. It's a small team and there are some people who rotate in and out of it, but it's a small team of about four guys and, uh, and we gang write everything. So anything that I'm hired on is written kind of like a sitcom where, um, where the, the basic skeleton is done and then pieces are given out and it's put back together and then comes about three days of massively rewriting all together. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's what I stole from. So is it done Skype. via just Skype or? It's or? Skype. Sometimes it's in person. Sometimes I, I work, a couple of my writers are actually not far from where I am. Mm -hmm. uh, so we write together. Other times, if there's an event that we're all at, let's say we're in New York for an event, um, we might do some work in the hotel. Um, but most of it is a Skype. Actually, we prefer, at the, these days, we prefer Google Hangouts. Mm -hmm. um, no offense. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I don't own I know. stock in either. So. Exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. So we do it, and it's a bunch of uh, it's a bunch of guys yelling at each other. And the thing that's great, this is what I've instilled in my team, is is I have this atmosphere of one upping where I want everyone to outshine everyone. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this kind of battle to see who's going to impress me. Yeah. So all the guys are always trying to beat the other guys, and it's done in a friendly manner. But also in that equation is I want them to beat me too. There's actually a reward for beating me. What's the reward? Well, it's different on every project, right. but let's just say there is incentive to, um, to taking one of my lines and showing me how yours is better. And if you win that battle, it, it financially becomes rewarding. Okay. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so it's an environment of literally really trying to put out the best. And the one thing we have, as I go back to what you were, what I was saying about being locked in a room all alone is the one thing that copy needs is eyeballs. And I think that that's another thing too, the comedy needed it, You need eyeballs. You need to have people to run this stuff by. Yeah. And I had so many clients, especially in the early days who, you know, will they, they always pick the wrong people to run stuff by. It's like, hey, listen, I wrote this and my wife loved it. Yeah, this is a prostate product that your wife is never going to buy. Right. So it doesn't matter if your wife loves it, it means nothing. Um, so, yeah, having that team to just bounce off and rely on is just, I find very valuable. Probably the most valuable thing in my business. Yeah.
And I want to hear about what brought you to being a copywriter. But, but first, I want to ask about one quick win that the audience can do to get results now. Uh, what could they do to get results now? Now, I know there was a pre-interview, and I'm trying to think, did I answer this you question? Said, uh, you talked about referrals. Okay. So this is, this is um, I thought the question was about how to, how to grow their business. Yeah, whatever. And, yeah. and, and honestly, referrals is, was the way I did it. It's the way I've trained other people to do it, and it works whether it's a service or a product. So, for instance, in my business early on, um, I would tell happy clients, um, by the way, if, if, if you have friends of yours in the business, marketers you run into, let them know who wrote your copy. And if they hire me, I'll give you $500 off your next project. I got from a handful of clients, I'm not joking when I say four or five clients, I ended up with 25 clients. Wow. And it's, it's, it's great on two levels. First of all, you're getting leads, which is great. You're getting people in the door to give you leads, which is very important, especially when you're starting out. And number two, the, the, the payment scheme of this referral thing is it, it, it requires you to get another job from an old client at the same time. You're not giving the client $500. Right. You're giving them $500 off the next project. Right. And I had I got so much work from it. It never cost me a dime. So I always recommend people do it. I have students of mine in the past who've done it and continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And also it works if you sell a product. If you sell a product and you've seen these these uh, sales funnels before where it's uh, you know you can buy it for 197 or get two of your friends to buy it and yours is free. Right. It's the same yes. thing. You're not really giving anybody anything free. You're just taking a little bit of profit off the other two to pay for this guy's yes. one. So yeah, referrals are probably the best. And, and it also comes and pays me off in spades even now. Um, I don't really get referrals for money like that anymore. But I'd say 90% of my business is word of mouth business. Mm -hmm. It's either, either uh, clients coming back for more or clients telling other people. So Yeah. And I want to ask about how you got your first client, but first about first about what you know where you grew up and what brought you to copywriting. What was an okay. influence for you early on, an inspiration okay. for you? Early inspiration for me, my father. I know this is probably cliche. You hear it a lot. Um, my father backed me for no, no matter what I did, mm -hmm. and um, I never knew I would get into copywriting uh, while he was alive. Uh, he has passed, uh, obviously. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and he said it was all because of your video interview. So what was? I'm blaming you, Jeremy. You killed my father. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> no, um, my uh, my father was many many things in my life. He was a restaurateur. He was a a a contractor. He was a home builder. He was a developer of property. He um, so he was an entrepreneur. I mean, oh, yeah. my whole life, my father, my father had a problem with authority. He could never work for people. Yeah. And um, he, my father was in the Air Force. And the joke he used to tell was because he left not with a dishonorable discharge, but with what they call a general discharge, okay. which means it's not an honorable discharge. <laughs> right. And it had something to do with fist fighting with a superior. And that's my father was from the streets of, you know, Little Italy in New York. And uh, my father's joke he used to tell was that everybody else he was in the Air Force with had stripes from their shoulder to their wrist, and he had no sleeves. <laughs> so they just ran out of stripes to remove from him right. and just ripped his sleeves off. And, and so he lived his life like that, was bad with authority, got arrested once when he was young because he, he punched a cop. Just out with his buddies one day at the beach, Coney Island in Brooklyn, and decided this cop needed to be punched. No reason, but that was my father. Very anti um, power figures, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, he he worked for himself, had many many businesses, and and I worked in most of them. But the one thing I never realized all along was that he was training me not just in entrepreneurship, but I always thought, you know, I always claimed that I came into this business not being a salesman. I'm one of the few who came into this business not being a salesman. But the truth is, when I look back at it, I think everything my father did had an element of being a salesman. Yeah. What do you mean one, not being a salesman? Directly. I'm sorry? What do you mean not being a salesman? 
Well, I mean, I came from it from the creative end, and most people come to it from being a salesman. Okay. And I was never that. I was always a guy who liked telling stories. Yes. You know, when I was a kid, I told stories. When I was a comic, I told stories. And then when I was a writer, that's what I got paid to do. That was the mm-hmm. dream. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I found out my father was was a uh, a salesman. And um, he would get, he would close clients in his contracting business by selling them, just like we do in print or in a video. Um, he would, my father at one point literally was a salesman. He owned a car dealership, a used car dealership, and he literally was selling cars. And, uh, but everything else, the restaurant business, my father always knew how to push people onto the thing he wanted you to eat. It, whether or not that was the more profitable item or the item he knew was really good today, he always knew how to get people to listen to him. Yeah. So I think I learned that early on from him. Just didn't realize I learned it. Yeah. So, so what was your favorite job with your dad, and what was your least? Okay, then or looking back? Because looking, then looking, I think. Yeah. I think my least favorite jobs with my dad were construction when he yeah. was building houses, and I had to learn to do everything. You had to do. You have to do heavy labor. Oh, I did, first I was a gopher when I was 13. I was the guy who went for the coffee and swept up and did all that. Was paid $20 a day in the summer, which was a lot for a 13-year-old at the time. And uh, and then as I got older, he had me doing more and more stuff. By the time I was 17, I was I was building. I mean, I was literally, you oh. know, I was building roofs. I I built the garage at our house. I built entirely by myself. Without even my father's help. Should we be scared about that? Time. Oh. Excuse me? Should we be scared about that? Like not parking the It's car? funny because my wife and I took a ride back. Uh, this was at a short period of my life where I lived in, in the Poconos of Pennsylvania uh, in, uh, toward the end of high school. And, um, and we went back just recently just to look at the house. Mm-hmm. And the garage was not only standing straight and true. But it hadn't changed a lick. I mean, it hadn't been painted in 40 years wow. or 30 years, whatever it is. And um, so I was kind of impressed with that. You know? That is impressive. Uh, so for me, you know, I look back and I go, I hated those days. But then when I can look back and look at stuff I built yeah. or know that when my wife wants to do the tile over in our kitchen, I can do that. If I decide to, I know how to tile. I can do that. Right. So uh, so I think that's probably my, at the time, my least favorite and now my favorite. And if you want to know, my favorite back then was probably the restaurant. Yeah. What kind of restaurant because, was it? Well, uh, over the years, my grandmother is famous for something. And uh, you can't find her in the books because there's no book about this. But there used to be a newspaper article from like the 30s that my grandmother used to have. And it's somehow as we've lost it over the years. But it was from some New York newspaper that doesn't exist anymore that was talking about this little pizza shop owner Mm -hmm. in the Bowery of New York City who, uh, because of the Depression, was decided to, to cut up a piece of pizza and sell it by the slice. My grandmother, according to this article, invented pizza by the slice. That's amazing. It is amazing. It's one of those things that I'm very proud of. And it's also one of those things that you tell people and you know that some of them are going, oh, that's great. And they're thinking, what a load of shit. <laughs> um, but uh, so my family has always been in the pizza business. My father was also done in fine dining in, in Italian and, and at one point had a, a landmark uh, American restaurant in Florida. Uh, so yeah, it's it's been all different kinds of restaurants. Yeah. But I've I enjoyed working at all of them. And today, to this day, if anybody wants a pizza, I can spin them on my finger yeah, if I have to. Yeah. So I mean, I could talk food with you all day, and I I actually <laughs> prefer New York style pizza to Chicago pizza. Oh, seriously, they're Personally, gonna break down the doors there. Yeah, yeah. But how do you go from? I could see the path. Um, you know, restaurant construction. How did you get to comic? Okay, I was I went to I went to college, um, uh, a small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania, um, and I went and studied theater. I was on a theater scholarship. I was always the actor, the clown, the person who wanted to, the person who was in the plays. I never got the lead in plays. I always got the the buddy part in the plays because those were the funny characters. I got you. And, yes. And so so I did that a lot, and always said, well, I'm going to be an actor. That's what I'm going to be. And I went to college. Didn't finish, but I went to college for a couple uh, couple years and then uh, left college because my family had moved to Florida, and I was up in, in the cold winter in Pennsylvania. And I went down to visit them on break and said, oh, this is kind of cool down here. And I just kind of visited them and stayed. And, uh, and then one day while working at my father's restaurant, uh, somebody comes in with a flyer for open mic night 
in some small little hole in the wall inside the mall. And uh, so they're like, you're funny. You should do this. And I went in there and, and I have to tell you, not to toot my own horn, but I sucked. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, I was bad. I was doing comedy magic at the time because it was something I'd watched other people do. And I thought, oh, that's fun. I'll do that. But I had no right to be doing it. Um, and then finally, after a while, for about six weeks of that, I kind of dropped it and just started talking about my family and being Italian and being from up north and this kind of thing and found people laughed. So I, it was a time in comedy. I got very lucky because... And I'll tell you this during my entire career. I get lucky a lot. A lot of this is luck. But um, I got lucky because... That's what uh, Bill Gates says too, by the way. Does he really? Yeah. I see us as kindred spirits. Yes. <laughs> um, we're, you know, we share the same yacht. Yes. No. Um, but uh, I was, a, um, I was uh, an amateur comic who'd been doing it for four months. I was doing open mic nights. And literally... It was the mid 80s, and this is when the first comedy boom came. And all of a sudden, clubs were opening up everywhere, and they needed comics. I literally, four months in, started getting booked at comedy clubs around the state, and then around the East Coast, and then around the Midwest. And I'd been doing comedy maybe a year and a half, and I was working the whole country. And I literally got out of Dad's restaurant and was lucky enough to be touring around the country. A couple of years after that, I was able to tour you know, other places in the world. Wow. And it, was, uh, it, it worked out great for me. The, pro the reason I stopped which I'm sure would be your next question. Why did I go from that to writing was? I'd moved to Hollywood because Jerry Seinfeld had just gotten his sitcom and it became a little bit of a hit at the time. It's just a little bit of a hit at the time. It wasn't you know, what it turned into. But that is when every stand-up comic started moving to L.A. Mm -hmm. thinking, it's my I turn. See. I get I my sitcom. I see, yeah. And I was among the almost everyone else who didn't. And I thought that I would, I thought that I could, I thought I deserved it. But even now, looking back in retrospect, I, you know, Seinfeld had been on the road for 20 years when he got his sitcom. Me, I've been on the road for like three years when I moved to L.A. Right. So um, I, I should I'm sure in so. comic traveling days, that seems like an eternity, though. Um, it did seem like a long time, and I enjoyed it. I had a, a very fun time. In other words, some guys have other stories about being broke. I was paid well. I worked after, you know, by the time I was doing it three years, I had moved up to um, headliner status. Well, about four years, headliner status. And that was you were making the big money. And it's headliner status is not like what it really is. Headliner static in the old days of the comedy club, you were the guy who had 45 minutes of material. And then the, the act who opened for you had a half hour material and the new guy had 15 minutes of material. Mm -hmm. So I had just gotten to a point where I had 45 minutes of funny material. And so I got the, the job of headliner, which was more money. But um, by no stretch of the imagination, in most places I worked, was I a guy who would put asses in seats. Nobody knew who I was. A real headliner is somebody who you know, draws people in. Right. And it wasn't like that back then. Mm -hmm. So um, one claim to fame, kind of, I used to co-headline, which means I would share the headlining job with a guy named Carrot Top, and who went sure. on to become very, very famous yeah. and very, very rich. And he was the greatest guy in the world back then before all the surgery and the roids, or whatever it is, allegedly. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I worked with him, and we would go and work gigs in the South. In North Carolina. Is often. he from the South or he is actually from Boca Raton, Florida, okay. I think. I know I think it's Florida. Like from... Why are so many comics from Florida? But yeah, um, go ahead. Because Florida gets the dregs from all over the world. This is and I'm not saying all the comics are dregs, but Florida is you know when you have like a pan full of drippings? Yeah. They all flow. When you tilt that pan, they all flow down into the into the corner. That's Florida. <laughs> Florida gets all the dregs from the pan, and then among these dregs, you get a lot of people from different walks of life. And so I'm not seeing the, all the people who are down the comics. Some of the best comics I know are in Florida, some old friends. Yeah. But um, but what was my point? I was talking about – Carrot uh, Top. Okay, Carrot Top and I would co-headline, which – Whenever we worked, it was always like I would see his act. The first time I saw him, it's like – and co-headline means, okay, Wednesday night, you close the show and I open for you. And Thursday night, I, I close the show, you open for me. And I remember seeing him on the Wednesday night close the show. 
And um, and then after the show was over, we were at like a Denny's or whatever. And I remember turning to him and going, yeah, listen, I'll just open for you all week. <laughs> because it was one of those things where it became – he was what he is now. He was a guy who frenetically would pull stuff out of trunks and it was crazy stuff. He'd get big laughs. And when he was done, I'm not kidding, there would just be mounds of toys on the stage. And then they'd be like, and now you're next comedian. And it would be like really you hard. You can't to, follow that, yeah. Yeah, no, I did not want to have to follow him. I did it once or twice and never want to do it again. Great guy. But um, so he and I had the same manager in, out of North Carolina at the time. Um, I don't know where I was going with the story. Or am I leaving you with a cliffhanger? <laughs> Answer later. You be the judge. No, I wanted to get to actually the, the comedy days because – I know that you learn a lot and you bring that to copywriting. How did you get your first client then? Okay. I, I, I'll I back up slightly and say I, I went from, from, from comedy to writing television right. because um, I, I thought I was going to get my own sitcom and didn't. But I did get little writing jobs along the way. And each one of those would come along and just pull at me a little bit in the early days, enough for me to call up my manager and cancel gigs. So I'd get like a job here for six weeks and I'd have to cancel two weeks in Denver or something. And as I had to keep making these phone calls to cancel, finally the manager said, you know what, let's cancel the rest of the year. You just be a writer. I was kind of forced because he was just sick and tired of me canceling gigs. Right. And left. So um, I became a writer and did that for many, many years. So now we jump forward um, to switching from that to copywriting. Um, I got married in early 2000s. And um, and my wife wanted to raise a family, and I did not want to raise a family in Los Angeles. It was yeah. that simple. And then it's when I realized in utter panic that I had spent my entire adult life in Los Angeles writing comedy. Yeah. And th those jobs don't exist anywhere else but Los Angeles. So I realized if I leave L.A., I'm completely unemployable. And that was where another panic came in. And then it was like it was literally like a, a weird beacon of hope out of nowhere. I got I got a piece of spam in my inbox from a copywriting course that basically said if you could write a page like this, you could make lots of money as a copywriter. And I read it and thought, oh, I could write circles around that, and uh, and took the course. And um, I'm jumping here, but I literally did very well on told you on that assignment. I right. did very well. Used that not really as a calling card to get work or anything, but it became the thing that gave me confidence. I knew now that I was at least as good as everyone else who made it through that course. So I entered a contest, and that contest was being held by two copywriters, um, Mike Morgan and Matt Marshall. And they had been in a contest a couple of years before or a year before. And uh, and they did well for them, so they held a con a contest, uh, and I went up against like twenty other copywriters, and it was all based on nothing but results. So it was basically we have this is the product. You each write your own sales letter. We run traffic to it equally. Whichever one sells the most wins the contest. And I had won over everybody. I had just wow. it wasn't like I sold millions of units, but um, I sold like six, and nobody else sold any. So it was, it was like that. It was that. It was small time, but again, it was a boost of confidence. Right. So what you win with that was uh, what the, the prize was you get to be mentored by Mike and Matt. And I learned, and I think they'll laugh about this, that the day I won, and I wasn't even going to enter because I was just like, yeah, I don't know. Because a lot of the guys who were in the contest were professionals already who'd been writing. And, and I kind of got a private phone call from one of them who said, just enter the contest. You're going to probably win the damn thing. And that was another, again, these little boosts of confidence that you need along the way. And um, so I won the contest. I start mentoring with them, and it was very little mentoring. It was it was wonderful time, and I needed it like crazy. But a lot of it was this, okay, listen, I've got this client, doesn't have the money to pay me. I'll, uh, you take the job for $500. My first day being mentored, I had a gig. They just gave me a gig for $500. I'm like, okay, now how do I do it? And they go, well, you, you know, you're right. Read the product and you just and you go in there and you write the thing and, and it'll be fine. Don't worry. If you have any questions, just ask. So I asked them about 10 questions during the process of writing it and 
it went to the client. The client was very happy. And I'm like, well, that's good. And in the middle of writing that one, one of them comes to me and says, here, listen, here's a client. He called me. I don't know how much money he has. He doesn't have enough money for me. So why don't you just call him and talk to him and just, you know, get the job. And I go, well, what do I ask for? How much money do I ask for? I don't know. Ask for like, what'd you get on the last one? I go, you gave me $500. And he goes, ah, ask for $1,500. So I go, okay. I went in there, asked for $1,500 and got the job. And then the next one after that just became like, you know, you have successes along the way and your prices keep going up. But to get to like the first three jobs, this is what I learned most from those, we'll call them mentors, but they were guys who were a step above me who helped bring me along because I was also helping them because it was taking a load off of them that they couldn't handle. I mean, in a couple, at least one instance, the project I was writing very cheaply was something that one of them had already promised to a client, but did not want to write now because it was so cheap. Mm. Because they had come along, they had they had passed uh, you know passed that grade, and so um, so I took all those uh, uh, all that I learned from them, which was believe in yourself, go out there and do it, go. And just get the, you know, there's a thing in Hollywood for actors. I did a little bit of acting. It was never my, really my thing. But there's a thing for actors that you're told by your agent. And it's no matter what it says the job requires, you say you can do it. And then we'll figure it out later. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of actors who like to go on up for like a movie that requires them to be on horseback. And they're like, can you ride a horse? Oh, you kidding? I was in the rodeo for six years. I'm great on the horse. And you get the job and then they, you know, pre-production comes like, yeah, I'm going to need riding lessons. You know, it's like you, the whole idea is to get the job. Get the job and yeah. that's kind of what it was instilled in me by these guys early on. Go get the job and then work your ass off and just make it work. Right. And that helped me a lot in the early days. What I got from them, I wasn't with them very long. It was only a few months, maybe two, two and a half months. But they had kind of seen that I was growing and <clears throat> kind of had my own legs. And Mike, and I don't know if Matt, but I know Mike's mentor was David Garfinkel, who I will say, I know you've talked to him before, he is the world's greatest copywriting coach. I knew it then. Everyone knew it. I hold it to this day. People, some people try to push it on me as being this great coach. I think I'm pretty good. He's the best. So, what makes him the best? What did he? What advice? Did I he don't give you? know. It's funny because all the things he does when you when you break them down, at least what he, I don't know if he does it with everybody. What he did with me, it wasn't a lot of teaching. He didn't like show me how to do things. It's funny. I had someone ask me who had mentored with David, like, so how many times did he ever like, like look at your writing and tell you what you were doing right and wrong? And I go, let me see. Um, I don't think he ever did. I mean, I was with him for like 18 months and I don't think he ever, you know, um, looked at my writing and told it was right and wrong. He just knew how to get me to be really good. And I, I don't know, this is why he's great because I can't even duplicate what he did. Some of it may have been the rapport. Some of it may have been the, the, the mystique of him. You know, maybe you put more emphasis on someone, you put more import on someone when you hear they're the best. And maybe that's it. Maybe because I knew he was the best that I kind of listened to everything he ever told me. And just I remember one big copywriting rule that I live by to this day that I got from him was don't be afraid of ellipses. You don't want to use them like properly like you would if you're in a literature class. But the, the three dots, they're your friend. You want to use them whenever you can because what happens is a period will stop the person reading. But the ellipses force them to go to the next line. Interesting. Yeah. And I did that and sometimes to to hilarious effect with too many ellipses where you had to go. Actually no, now I'm um, looking at what you wrote in the document and I see all the ellipses. Uh-huh. Yes. Oh yeah, I that's the way I write. It's natural. I teach that way. So it's like something I picked up from David. But um I I have this funny little story, side story if you don't mind. I had a client that David had given to me. He was a mentoring client with David. He wasn't a copywriter, he was a business owner. But he needed writing, and David, he wasn't going to pay David. He needed someone you know, closer to my level. And although I was coming along and I, was, I had no retainer clients, I think, I, I think my price had gone up like 1,400% or something by that point. But still, this guy was going to be a guy who was going to pay me a check every month to just write what little things he needed written. Turned out he needed like a new sales letter every month. 
they all over over abuse you when right, you're uh, right. when you're on retainer. But at the time, it was like um, he always wondered why things took so long. So he'd go like, "Yeah, listen, I, can I get this sales letter Thursday?" And I go, "I can start it maybe Thursday, but it's going to be like three weeks." Why does it take so long? And he just never understood it. So I was at David, um, David, John Carlton, and a guy named Harlan Kilstein mm -hmm. had a, a copywriting event that we went to. Mm -hmm. And at this event also was David's mentoring student, my client. So in the morning, John Carlton uh, was talking about how he goes through writing, very similar to what I do, which is there's a lot of what John calls percolating. There's a lot of just kind of sitting with the – the product and the concept and the idea and thinking. A lot of writing is like done research before this. type of stuff. Yeah, not, not even research. Not I mean, really. research is obviously a big part, but a lot of writing is just done. And again, this again takes me back to writing television. You know, a lot of jokes are written laying on the couch, throwing a ball in the air while you're with the other guys. It's kind of like that with copy, too, where a lot of time you're just thinking about the product, putting yourself around people who would be your market. Yeah. I mean, I have a couple tricks that I do in that world, you know, about how to spy on people without them knowing it to kind of know what the market wants. Um, but it was this idea of percolating. And John would say that on his projects at the time, he would take 12 weeks um, to write a single sales letter. And that like eight of it was percolating. Eight of it was just getting in the right frame of mind. You know, a writer, um, writers tend to procrastinate. Um, there was a movie uh, called The Big Picture back in the mid-80s and Kevin Bacon played a writer-director and he had to write this movie because he was contracted to write it and he did a lot of staring at the cursor, the blank screen and when a writer's staring at the screen they notice everything. They may not ever get those opening words but they'll notice everything so it's a whole bunch of like dusting off the keyboard and staring at that screen or you know in a film you'd write fade in and then it would just be a blinking cursor and nothing and then all of a sudden the windex comes out and you wipe the screen it's like all this all these things you realize oh should i open those blinds you know what i'm going to organize the bookshelves all these things that get in the way because right. writing it's is famously the thing that writers put off yeah. and you put it off till the end so i think that's why the percolating is so important back to the client the client sees john talk about 12 weeks to write a single sales letter. And remember, my guy was complaining about three weeks or four weeks. And I was rushing it for him because I don't like to do it, at the time didn't like to do it in three, four weeks. And um, he, we come to the break after John speaks for two hours. And my client puts his arm around my neck and he goes, buddy, I get it. Now I get it. I see why it takes long. You don't have to ever worry about me rushing you again. I think to myself, well, that's one great thing that came out of this, this uh, event. We go in after lunch. We come back in the afternoon. And Harlan Kilstein is speaking. And his whole, you know, John's whole speech is about the 12 weeks of percolating. And, Har and Har Harlan's whole presentation is, I swiped a million-dollar sales letter in an hour. And here's how you can do it. And he went in teaching people how to swipe. And he talks about the sales letter he made in one hour that was all swiped from a former sales letter. And it made a million dollars. And we, so he speaks for two hours. We get out of there for a break. My client comes back and he puts his arm around my neck and goes, could we do it like him? <laughs> it's like he completely lost the whole meaning of the Carlton thing. And all he was looking for was the fix. Quick he just as, wanted the quick quick as possible. And, and that's been something I've not been able to do. I've not been able to be a good swiper. I'm good at being inspired by other people's copy, researching copy. But I'm not a person who could take a sales letter and say, oh, this is a sales letter for, for gumdrops, and I'm going to use that same sales letter with the same tactics and the same emotion, and I'm going to use it to sell tires. I'm never, I'm not saying it's wrong or right, I just can't do it. It's just your and style. It probably, it probably comes from, you know, you can't steal on television, and while it's called swiping and copy, it's called stealing in television, and it's really called stealing in stand-up yeah. comedy. Yes, you can't steal jokes. I was so. watching a Joe Rogan podcast, and it was like a, <laughs> it was um, three people on the stage, and they were talking exactly about stealing other people's bits. Happens every day. Um, Carlos Mencia is one of the most famous thieves, but the most famous thief I ever heard about. 
and this is one that went around for many years, it's not a secret amongst comics, Robin Williams. Robin Williams, known for being a guy who could think quickly off the cuff on his feet, but in the early days, um, there may have been some pharmaceuticals involved, but in the early days, he would go to the improv and watch a comedian, and then he would watch, uh, he would watch a comedian do his act, and then the next night in this, on the same stage or two weeks later on a different stage or on a TV special, that would come out of his mouth as an improv, and it was literally the guy's joke. Mm. And um, so, yeah, he was the most famous uh, thief. But none of this is about copywriting. So why am I even mentioning it? Just don't. We were your... talking about your mentors and ah. and your first copywriting, uh, you know, some of your first copywriting gigs. And that person wanted you done really quickly. There you go. Yes. That's how we got there. Uh -oh. He was a doctor. He was a good guy. We ended up parting ways because I couldn't. Because, again, it was one of those things where it's, in this business, when you get good, um, the market pays you for it. Yeah. And the one thing you'll find, it's just, here's another tie-in to my days on stand-up comedy. Okay. Um, in, uh, in this business, the clients who hire you early on, they'll keep using you until your prices get much more expensive. So, I've, for instance, I have a guy, I won't mention his name because I'm going to say something negative about him. Yes, but I, and I, I don't edit, him. so... There you go. Yeah. I took him. I'm not even going to say what niche he's in. But he was a young guy on ClickBank, uh, ClickBank, the affiliate thing. Um, he had a product, and um, and he was like 97th in his niche when he came to me. And I wrote, a sale, I wrote a sales letter for him, and he went from 97th to number one. And it's a big niche. Ended up making like a million dollars or something. He was like 23, 24 years old. So he comes to me like a few months later. And he loves me, and he says, "Listen, I got this new product. I want, I want you to do this video. How, how, you know, how much for the video?" And I tell him, and he's so he goes, "Yeah, but last time it was this amount." I go, "Yeah, last time I wasn't the guy who just made a twenty-four-year-old a million dollars. Now I am, and you should know because you made the damn million dollars." Right. So he goes, no, "Okay," and then so my prices have gone up maybe fifty percent, and then like. Two years later, he'd stayed away for two years. He made money with both of those those two products. Stayed away for two two years uh, with hiring me, and then he comes to me and says, "Listen, I need a brand new sales funnel for this new product." He explains it to me, and I give him my then price. I said, "This is how much I'm getting now, and uh, I'll give you a discount because you're an old client, uh, and I would like to do this for you." And he literally was like, "Wow." That's how much you charge? I don't know if I can afford that. I go, you just bought a damn penthouse in Toronto, for crying out loud. You can afford it. Trust me. And we went through this back and forth and back and forth. And he said, okay, I'll call you Monday and we'll work it out. And I never heard from him again. And this is not just one client. Clients who love you, but they love you at the price you charge them when you made them a lot of money. And even though they made a lot of money... They, they, they don't love you as much when they realize they're going to part more. So let's see. Had that first sales that I wrote for the guy cost him $25,000. And he made a million dollars. Good investment. I think it's a hell of an investment. Yeah. And so if he comes back a year later or two years later and all of a sudden now it's $40,000, I still say, now while nothing is certain, still probably a pretty good investment to pay for that. But they don't see it that way. And it's the same thing in stand-up comedy. You will never, the club you start at, the club that you were an amateur comic at where you worked on five and ten minutes at a time, they will never pay you like one of the real comedians, the out-of-town guys. Even if you move away and come back, they'll bring you in and pay you. But it will never be at the full rate you get elsewhere because they see you as the amateur. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and that's how I tied it all together in a I like nice that. Then we are, I have several more questions, but I want to respect your time. We are right at the hour mark. Okay. Do you have a few more minutes or do you want to? Uh, I could take a couple talk? more minutes. I okay. enjoy talking. Okay. With you. Awesome. Um, because I want to get to and talk about some of the most successful campaigns okay. and why they were effective. Okay. So let's see. Um, I'll, I don't want to get into a lot of them. So I'll talk about yeah, some of them. Yeah, take talk. out. Talk Here's one, a problem talk I have too. One is one this, this is another thing too, yeah. Jeremy, that happens is 
um, the bigger you get, the bigger clients you get. And then all of a sudden you start dealing with paperwork that I never, like my early, my early um, relationships with clients, I never had a contract. It's like a handshake. It was a lot of it was a handshake over the phone. Yeah. And now there's like this contracts involved and there's on almost every client I sign an NDA now. So I can't even tell you. Yeah. I have one client who not only can't I mention that I work for him, I can't even I can't even let it slip out accidentally. That's in the clause that it yeah. can't like happen accidentally. Like I said, well, what if I don't publicly and I just let other people in the niche know that I no, especially not that, you know. So they get very. You're the secret weapon. They don't want. And I you. say, listen, for that, pay me more. If you want me to be exclusive, pay me more. And they won't want you to be exclusive. Some of them actually do. I have a guy in the sports business who has asked me to just be exclusive, and I say, well, that's going to cost you a lot more money for me to not write for anybody else in sports. Yeah. But um, okay, so. So I mean, because I don't want you to get in trouble. Maybe some of the components of why some of the successful campaigns were successful. Well, uh, I will tell you that I'm going to tell you an actual specific. Okay, example. go ahead. There's a product called Fat Burning Furnace. Yeah. And I, again, didn't have a contract when I wrote it. Um, I do have a contract now, though, since I've written for him since. And all I'm allowed to say is this. Um, I have done some writing for him. That's all I'm legally allowed to say. But I will tell you this. Fat Burning Furnace, when he came to me, it was a man selling a product um, that is notoriously for women. Online, the people who buy diets are women. It's like almost 70% women. Mm -hmm. And in the world of copy, that means you ignore the 30%. You don't try to be everything to everybody. You end up being nothing to anybody. Mm -hmm. So you have to ignore the small market, go after the big market. Yeah. There's a lesson for you. Um, and uh, so I knew that we need to turn this more toward the women. The problem was um, he's a guy. And the big competition that, that uh, ended up ultimately coming in uh, into his market was a woman. Now, um, he wasn't doing all that well, wasn't doing bad. So I rewrote the copy. Um, he made a, um, a, one of those doodle videos that are very popular. Yeah, I've seen those. And yeah. paid, paid like, I don't know, maybe $35,000 for the, for the doodling, wow. whatever it was. It was a lot of money. Yeah. And, um, and uh, he, go, he goes number one. He goes, shoots from the middle of nowhere to number one, becomes this big, big success. And all I did was take, he was already talking about his family in his copy, but I had him take his wife, who was already a big part of his life, and I just made her a bigger part of the copy. I made it a lot more about him and his wife. Mm -hmm. And it, we never implied she was a partner in the product or anything, but I just made sure that I had him speak about her with reverence and love. And I knew that women watching, it's not as good as a woman selling a product, mm -hmm. but at least on camera, at least they'll buy from the perfect man. Right. And the perfect man loves and respects his wife. So I made sure to put that in. Yeah. So I think that little things like that, and those are also things that turn me on. Those are the kind of things that I love doing in, in, uh, in a campaign, is finding the thing that's wrong. And sometimes I never find it. It's just the way it is. Uh, I'm doing one right now to take the flip side of that. I'm doing one right now that um, just not cracking it, and it's killing me. But I love the puzzle and I love trying it and trying to figure it out. And it's a product that I'm a partner on too. So um, yeah, it's weird. It's weird to, to have something that you can't crack but still love waking up every day to try to crack it. What's your method for cracking it? You know, because you mentioned sitting on the couch. I picture, you know, sitting on the couch and throwing a ball up in the air. What's something you do that actually – well, it's kind of like that. Let me, I'll give you a separate example, not about this. <clears throat> One of my mentoring students is a former golf instructor. And he's now a copywriter. And he writes primarily in the sports niches. And he, um, he was going back to some old golf club that he used to teach at and was talking to the pro there about possibly on the side doing lessons because he was doing golf again. And um, he said, uh, he said, you think I could teach here? And the guy said, I would love to have you. He said, but I got so many guys teaching here that are, you know, that, that are guys who pay to be here to, you know, to hang their shingle at our resort that they would kill me if I let you in. So he said, but you know what? If you could get leads for them, uh, they will, um, I'm sure they would give you a percentage. So he came to me with this idea, my student, and he says, 
you know, leads by getting leads to other golf pros. What do you think of that? So I said, well, let's talk about it. So we talked about it for a little while, and I thought, well, that's, you know, I love referrals. Referrals are a great thing, and I never saw it, thought about it from that angle. So I started thinking, well, you know, working on referrals is good, but what about this instead? So this came after like an hour of just kind of virtual ball tossing. You know, we were just talking on the phone, right, on Skype. And I said, well, what about this? Oh, now this was actually, by this point, we were on email. And he wrote back to me, and I wrote to him, I said, he said, what do you think about me um, consulting and teaching these guys how to market themselves? So I said, ah, and I wrote back, this is the ball toss. I said, ah, $5,000, and I will consult with you on how to market your golf instruction business. You don't have $5,000? How about nine ninety seven for my templates in a box system for marketing your golf business? You don't want to spend a thousand dollars? Buy my ebook for ninety seven. And then my client wrote back to me. My student wrote back and said, "Bingo!" And literally has already sold it. He's already got clients for this, and this happened a week ago. But that's one of those things where it just kind of sometimes hits you. Yes. And but like in a situation where you can't find it, what do you do? I will. Um, Try everything. Sometimes you have to just throw a bunch. Uh, sorry about the language, but sometimes you just throw enough shit at the wall and you'll find it. And well, uh, that's the thing, though. Going, doing that back and forth brainstorming is you. It's almost like that group work that you're talking about. You know, when yeah, you're in that room, you can't do that alone. Yeah. All you can do alone is come up with really good ideas and think to yourself, "Is that good or does that suck?" I don't know how many times to this day. I come up with a great idea, like a million dollar idea, that I'm not sure it's a million dollar idea. I got to kick it around. And I'll get like one guy might go, yeah, that's good. I like that. And the other guy might be quiet. And I'm going, what, no good? What, what is it? What are you seeing? Tell me what I'm not seeing. And he'll go, no, I'm just thinking. I think that's fucking brilliant. And he will just, so I'll know that, okay, now I'm going to bring this wide, bring it to the bigger team, and then start going outside. But sometimes, it, you know, it's very rare that you can do it yourself. So when you coach someone, what is your method for coaching? Ah, it's different from David's, although I picked up things from David. I really like to be hands-on I like to help solve the riddle you know I like I like solving the puzzle so my clients my mentoring clients they come to me with the quandary the here's the situation this guy came to okay one of my students came to me recently and says how do you stop how do you stop getting low paying leads and he said I've got five new clients that are all heard about me by word of mouth they all want 18 hours of work for $5. Exaggerating, but not so much. All right, to. Everybody right. wants a lot of work for a little bit of money. How do you stop getting these clients? And again, I'm, I hate tying this back. I'll go back to what a good friend of mine said when we were stand-up comics. He was my opening act. We started out together, but we went on the road. He was the guy who opened for me. And he came to me one time and asked me the same question. He says, I'm just as funny as you. Why am I opening for you all the time? And I said, because you agree to the job. They ask you if you'll open for me, and you say yes. If they asked me if I would open for you, I'd say no. That's why you're opening for me. Mm -hmm. And he learned a lesson there. He learned that you have to sometimes say no to gigs. So my, my student asked me, how do I stop these guys from hiring me to do a lot of work for a little bit of money? And I said, one word. No, just say no. Mm -hmm. You gotta say no, and uh, not always so, easy to do, especially if early on. You're trying to, yeah. You know, that's that's the thing. Yeah. My buddy, back to stand up. My buddy, we were struggling comics together, and I, at the time I wasn't a headliner. It was a a, a featured act, a middle act, and I, the difference in money at the time was like for three days as a as a um, an opening act, you get like a hundred fifty bucks. A middle act, the feature act, might make six hundred bucks, and then the headliner would make like fifteen hundred bucks. So that's it's a big disparity in in price. Mm -hmm. So we were both like at the same level, like opening guy. We were the hundred fifty dollar weekend guy, and then some guy came to him and said, "Listen, Mike, I've been wanting to get you in my club. I hear you're very funny. Um, I don't have a whole week for you, but I've got." Somebody dropped out for just Friday, two shows Friday, and a show Saturday. 
So you just hear like overnight, like, and he was in Florida, and the gig was in Michigan, and he was gonna have to drive to Michigan. He said, "I got a hundred and seventy-five dollars is all I got." <clears throat> My buddy Mike was like, "Well, it's gonna cost me thirty bucks in gas." Um, they're putting me up in a hotel. Uh, okay, so I'm still gonna make some, and I get stage time. Yeah, I'll do it. So he went up there and did it. Me, if they called me, I would have said, "Yeah, I'll do it for four hundred. Not a not a lot of money, but still, I I I I kind of let my status be known just by stating it, just by saying right. you're not going to treat me like some you know local guy. Yeah. So your expectations, yeah. <clears throat> and that's the thing too. When they pay, when they don't pay a lot, they don't expect a lot. They really expect. You know, that's the thing. When you're in comedy, I'm going to keep going. I never take it back to stand-up comedy. But in this interview, that's all I'm doing. In, in the days of comedy, they used to do on slow nights, they would paper the room. And that means hand out a bunch of flyers and get a bunch of free asses and seats so they could sell them drinks, help mm -hmm. pay for the show. Mm -hmm. These were always the worst crowds because they paid nothing to get in. And when people don't pay for something, they don't see value in it. So Yeah. So for fear, Vin, I'm going to keep you on all day. I'm going to just state this out loud. I'm going to ask two more questions, <laughs> or, or I will keep you on for another hour. Um, so I want to hear one of your proudest moments. Proudest moment was probably taking the 23-year-old kid from 97th to a millionaire. Um, it made me really feel like um, not only was I good at this, but that I, um, that what I did mattered. It wasn't just making money. It wasn't just a job. That I could do things for other people. I really love. This is what I love more than anything. I love writing for and consulting with people who really, really need the help. Not just the marketer who's burned his way through nine copywriters already. Because I've worked for those guys too. The big marketers who every every copywriter above you has written for already. And they're just making their way down to you. And they'll just keep going down. <clears throat> I've worked for them. And I get no buzz out of that. I get a buzz out of helping you know people who've never done it do really well. So. Isn't that hard to do because usually those people have a lower budget? Lower budget, but they, they often will do the same thing I think like I did with David Garfinkel, which is they will hang on your every word and they'll listen. Clients tend to not want to listen. And the bigger the client who thinks he knows what the hell he's doing, right. he will just he'll say, oh, yeah, great, great, and never do it. Yeah. I'm dealing with a guy like that right now who I try to tell this guy we're dealing with is – is listen you can't give me results of a test where nine people have seen the video there's no results there I gotta see a thousand eyeballs or I've seen nothing he does well I can't afford to well I'm telling you right now this is gonna go nowhere if you're gonna keep sending 12 people to the damn video you gotta you gotta have some real budget to test this right so it's you know dealing with that they just don't listen they think they know better they think they think you're out there to waste their money and I try to tell them listen uh, you're wasting money if you don't listen to me. So, yeah. and that's another thing too. The more as as you get more known in the business, and the more you can charge for your services, the more people will listen to you. But it yeah. boggles my mind that people will still just go. Ah, I, I know better than that. Right. I had a guy. I had a guy, and there's a famous. I don't know if you if you were in this at the time. A couple of years ago, there was a famous ClickBank sales video that came out where it was totally a lie. It was a big dramatized lie to sell product and it was a horrible dirty filthy thing and it was a guy who literally staged a video about a guy on his deathbed uh, mm -hmm. who was giving a secret to somebody and now you could buy that secret they literally shot video in a room that was dressed up like a hospital room with people in masks a guy in the bed it was filthy 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 mm -hmm. filthy I was paid to consult with this marketer before he ever made this video and he paid me for my time on the phone. And it, it isn't cheap. Um, he paid me a lot of money. And we get on the phone for a two-hour phone call. And the first thing he tells me is, Vin, I got this great idea. I know you love stories. I've got the best story in the world. He tells me, here's, here's the scene. Old man dying on a bed. Um, uh, he gives the secrets to the young guy. That's me. And then I sell the secrets to you guys at home and this is the secret to making millions of dollars 
And I said, you have this video of a guy giving you these secrets? He goes, no, no, but I got this great actor from Orlando and I got the great place to shoot it. And I'm going to direct it. It's going to be great. And I go, and, and, and so, so this never happened. He goes, no, no, it's a story. And I go, well, you know, your story, I can understand you're dramatizing a little, but your story's got to be based in truth. You can't just make shit up. <laughs> and he goes, oh, forget about that. He says, how do you think I should shoot this? Because I'm not sure. He was consulting with me to see, should he shoot it handheld? Should it be a good quality video or a cheap quality video? And so he states his whole case, and we stop. He talked for like 15 minutes, and finally there's a pause, and he goes, so what do you think? And the first words out of my mouth, there was a pause. I didn't say anything at first because I really wanted to just slam this guy. Just go, <clears throat> Dude, don't do this. He goes, what do you mean? It's going to be great. I go, do not do this. This is so wrong. This is filthy. You're going to probably get arrested. The FTC is going to close you. Whatever. You're not going to get away with this. This is wrong. And he goes, no, 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 forget that. I'm going to do it. I just need you to tell me how to do it right. And I go, again, I pause and I go, okay, how about this? You're not going to listen to me when I tell you it's wrong. How about this? You're not going to pull it off. There's no way anybody's going to believe you. He goes, no, I got this great actor in Orlando. I said, no, trust me, you don't have a great actor in Orlando. You have an Orlando actor. He's not a great actor. He's an Orlando actor. And you're going to direct it, and you've never directed anything. So this is not going to work. You're going to look like a fool. You're not going to sell anything. So aside from the whole thing that I think that you are a filthy, disgusting human being, forget that. Don't do this because it's going to be a failed experiment. And he said, you know what? I should have never paid for you. And he hung up on me. And two weeks later, he did the video, and it got shut down on ClickBank, and he got like pretty much, I think he lost probably a couple hundred thousand dollars on the product. Wow. And um, all he had to do was listen to me. There's so many ways to sell stuff. There's no reason to just make stuff up. And the worst thing was, too, he told people when he launched, uh, during the launch process, I didn't know this. Oh, yeah, this funnel is going to be killer because I consulted with Vin Montello right before. Oh, God. So every this came out, this filthy came out, and there were people telling me, did you write this or did you consult that? I go, what are you And they show me the video. I'm going, oh, damn. So I had to like go publicly and tell people I had nothing to do. I told them not to do it. And uh, that's what you got to deal with. Okay, you said you had one more question. My last me. question okay. is the cliffhanger question ah, so what's that qu cliffhanger the story of selling two shows to pick up a girl okay and by the way there's a little little trick there too when you do a cliffhanger make sure when you come back to it you remind them what you're doing so you always come back and say oh, that was that thing i i told you i was bad at cliffhangers no, that's <laughs> no. Good. you did it um okay the story this is the secret identity of the man who sold two tv shows just to pick up a girl first of all i'll reveal i'll give away the easy part now i'm the guy and I sold the TV shows because I'd, I'd gone out to Los Angeles about uh, two months before I moved there. I just wanted to get the lay of the land. I'd actually, I was dating a girl <clears throat> who worked at the Days Inn. And she got me a phony employee ID. And with that employee ID, I could get $10 rooms at any Days Inn in the country. So I went out to Los Angeles and booked a room for three weeks at a brand new Days Inn. That was my big ho Hollywood vacation. So I just wanted to see, get, get a, a lay, the lay of the land, see which clubs were good, where to hang out you know, which neighborhoods would be good to move into, all that. One of these nights while I'm there, I um, I go to the improv, and I try to get on stage, and I couldn't get on stage. My name wasn't pulled out of the fishbowl. So I'm sitting at the front bar, and this really hot girl is sitting next to me. And she uh, turns to me at some point. I'm, like, making another guy laugh, whatever. She, she nudges me and says, uh, so uh, what do you do? Oh, no, I bought her a drink. And then she thanks me and says, so what do you do? And I said, I didn't want to say I was a comic. And literally, I didn't even think I was going to be a writer. I didn't want to say I was a comic. This is your though, comic because, days. Excuse me? This is your comic days. You weren't this writing. This is when anything. I first went out to L.A. Yeah, I would only been a comic for like two years, three years. And um, so I'm at the improv, and everybody there in the bar at the improv is another comic who couldn't get stage time. And I didn't want to be another one of those guys because I knew that was not going to get me laid. So she goes, <clears throat> now, I was naive enough to think telling her I was a writer would get me laid. Everybody knows the writers in L.A. are like 
we are the peons of the business. You know, <laughs> everybody claims to be a writer. Everybody with a laptop and a gift card for coffee bean or Starbucks is a writer in LA. But I didn't know that at the time. So she goes, uh, so what do you do? So I say, I'm a writer, thinking I've just impressed her. She goes, oh, really? Anything I've seen? And I realized I had no backup. I had no follow-up to that. I didn't know what to say. So I said, well, I'm just here pitching shows to the networks. She goes, oh, really? Um, and she reaches into a purse, and she pulls out a card. She goes, pitch me first. And she gives me her card. And I won't say her name, but she, she worked for a company, at, uh, a big production company at New World Television. At the time, they were a, a TV studio that did like um, – uh, what was the Wonder Years was one of their big shows, so um, so she goes come pitch me tomorrow. So she goes uh, how about nine? I said oh no ten. She says I said how about eleven? She goes okay eleven. So I go great. I gotta go. I got another appointment to go. It's like ten o'clock at night. I got another appointment to, and uh, so I'll see you tomorrow. And then I I get out of there in my rent a car and I go to like a Seven Eleven and I buy a legal pad and a pen, and I realize I gotta write some TV <laughs> shows now. Went up to my room and spent most of the night, came up with three sitcom ideas. And long story short, the next, and did this just to pick this girl up. Next morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, I go and I meet with her and her two bosses at New World Television. And long story short, I left there and sold two of the shows wow. the th I wrote in the middle of the night. That's amazing. And then the, the little, there's another cliffhanger here that I won't leave you with because there's no time. But I will say that... Um, Moved to L.A. three months later, went in for my scheduled meeting at New World Television. The morning it was announced that New World Television was being shuttered, that the, uh, it had gone bankrupt. Wow. And that was like the week I moved to L.A. So I ended up selling the show. I made some advance option money, and they never did anything with it. So my first foray, I, that's another thing too, salesman. I said I never was a salesman. I sold freaking TV shows, and I knew nothing about what I was doing. So there you go. You tell good stories. There you go. I do my best. Vin, so where can people find you online? Which, where, what website should they check out? Best place to go is um, montellogroup.com. It kind of talks a little bit about the, the group writing, the gang writing uh, thing, how we do it. There's also a form there where you can contact me. Um, and we can talk. You can always find me on Facebook. I'm around. And uh, don't do the Twitter because I don't do the Twitter. So that's about it. Vin, this has been hugely valuable. I want to be the first one to thank you. you. You're a great interviewer. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Vin. You take care.